Hi, Anton Creel here from the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management. Welcome to London, where I'm joined here today by one of our senior trading mentors, Dr. Christopher Cathy. How are you doing, Chris? Great, Anton. Nice cool, welcome. Cheers. <laughs> Hi, this guy's got some grip. <laughs> so, uh, Chris, welcome to London. Uh, it's uh, Nice to be here, thank you. Yeah, quite funny to be here, actually, because uh, full disclosure, you and I used to work together at Goldman Sachs. Yeah, about a mile over there. Yeah, so we're just over here. Um, and now we're sitting here overlooking the city. Uh, I joined Goldman in 2000. You were a trader on the pan-European equities trading desk. Uh, and I joined 2000 and you've been there for about seven years previously. I joined in the, yeah. uh, 1993. 93, yeah. And then uh, I made my way around the city and left 2007, but you stayed on as well. Yeah, I joined uh, Goldman in 93. Started off in New York, uh, came back to London, traded on the uh, European desk of London from 93, 94 to 98. Uh, spent a bit of time in New York in, in, in between times, working in the US markets, uh, yeah. the international markets. Um, then went to Frankfurt for a year and a half to run our German uh, risk in Frankfurt. And then back to London from uh, 99 to 2006, mm -hmm. when I went to Merrill Lynch's hedge fund. Was there for three years and left just as the financial crisis started kicking. Um, experiences of um, different markets, different countries, sure. different sectors, all all fantastic. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, traded in the the bull market in the 90s, up to the Nasdaq bubble 2000, 2001, then the subsequent bear market, and then the bull market from so the 2003, 2004 lows to up to the financial crisis. So bull market, bear market, yeah. bull market again. Yeah. Seen them all and. Made money in all of them. Um, fantastic you know, uh, experience. Thoroughly enjoyed every moment. And obviously worked with you for quite a long time. Yeah, which was pretty interesting. Absolutely fantastic. We had some uh, fun and we made some money. Yeah, we caught a pretty amazing time in the financial markets, didn't we? Absolutely, absolutely fantastic. So obviously in the last 25 years or so, you've traded some uh, incredible market moves. Yeah, some fantastic moves to the upside and to the downside. So the last 25 years, all the bull markets, all the bear markets, and I guess from a risk perspective, You've been there, seen it, done it all before. Absolutely. Um, the risk, obviously, pr pr um, progressing through my career, risk increased and increased. Obviously, a function of the marketplace as well. Um, tend to find more risk is taken in bull markets, mm. um, as uh, and then less risk in the bear market. In my experience, that doesn't necessarily be the case. It seems to be the case. Um, but there's a general risk appetite out there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, traded bull markets, traded bear markets, taking risk in both. And made made money. So, on a risk from a risk perspective, I think a really good thing to talk about might be so. For example, like when I joined the desk at Goldman in two thousand, it was obviously the peak of a bull market at that time, as in the tech Nasdaq bubble, and we were sitting together on the trading desk. But I was just a kid at that yeah. time, so I was coming straight out of university, twenty one years old, and I probably looked at the desk. Well, not probably, definitely, I probably looked at the desk and the risk of the pan-European trading desk at Goldman through a different lens to the way you looked at it because you've been already there for seven years. So you were a senior guy on the desk. Yeah. And in fact, you were one of my mentors over yeah. those four years I was at Goldman. Yeah. The risk that you saw at that time, how did you see it? Because we probably saw it very differently. Well, risk is very difficult to quantify. Yeah. Is it, do you look at it uh, in a dollar amount or do you look yeah. at it in, in the terms of uh, a percentage or a multiple of daily transactions or daily, daily turnover? Sure. Um, clearly at Goldman Sachs, there was an, a, a huge focus on taking risk, both proprietary and also from um, customer market making activities. Yeah. The roles were both proprietary and customer market making, so facilitating making prices and working the agency business in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, the risk appetite across the whole firm generally increased over my career there um, and I think it's uh, Goldman were probably at the forefront though yeah. I think most places operate in the same amount of risk um, the risk is from your eyes would probably seem a bit uh, bit large and a bit crazy um, mm. being raw being raw and being new to the business yeah. from a more experienced eye it's the risk is there an opportunity to make money mm. so unless you're willing to take risk, you're not going to make any money. And that's something that really you need to be comfortable with. Mm. If you're uncomfortable with taking risk, then trading is probably not for you. If you're comfortable for it, with taking risk, do it correctly, you can make handsome returns. Yeah. And um, like I say, I've 
been there and done that and seen it in both bull market and bear market and risk is a necessary part of the business. Risk. And those people who like risk and embrace it, trading is the perfect, perfect career, perfect occupation or perfect way to make a living. Sure. So risk as in volatility equals volatility equals risk and opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is the difference. That is the mentality of somebody who embraces trading mm. is risk as an opportunity. Somebody mm. who is more risk averse, volatility can be an opportunity to lose money. Like low volatility or longer time frames. It's more investing rather than trading. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, clearly, any trader has to adapt to the market conditions. If we're working in, a, in an environment where the VIX is in sort of 10 to 15 level, mm. um, clearly we're in a low volatility environment, more difficult to make money, um, more suited to running a long term, um, medium to long term, long short portfolio, mm. volatility higher, you have more opportunities to make shorter term trades, trying to find you, a good trader needs to be able to work in both, both conditions. Mm. So going back, uh, so you left the market from the professional side? 2008. After about 16, 17 years? Yeah, yeah. 15, 16 years. Yeah, okay. 15, 16 bonuses. That's the way I think of it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so after 15, 16 bonuses, uh, you left the professional side. Yeah. Basically retired, right? Yeah. And I think, was is it right between 08 to 2013, you were basically not really doing much, just retired, relaxing, Relax, catching up? Relaxing, uh, being a full-time parent and yeah. um, trading my own money. Cool. Okay, so then... And then um, I remember the when you started giving the, the very, very early uh, fledgling seminars. Yeah. I think you did one in maybe it's Durham Business School and Newcastle Business School yeah. and um, stayed with me for a while. And uh, as the institute was getting up and running, and um, I thought it was a fantastic idea. Mm. Absolutely fantastic idea. And, and not just for your own personal and involvement and developing a business, but also there is a real need for the education that we can provide to people. Sure. I find it very, very frustrating that retail traders can trade by themselves without any help or education and just yeah. basically lose money. So, so I think what you did was incredible. So Absolutely if you recall incredible. in like 2013, so the way the Institute progressed, um, live seminars 2011, 2012, yeah. around the United Kingdom. And then we went global in 2013. Yeah. <clears throat> and if you recall, uh, the conversation we had in 2013 was quite funny because yes. I was literally losing my mind because yes. it was growing so quickly that I could not handle the amount of mentoring programs that were demanded. I think there literally remember, were not enough hours in the day for you. Oh yeah, literally, not yeah. enough hours in the day. Yeah. So um, I was thinking to myself, who, who do I call? And obviously we work together. Yep. I know your quality and knew obviously of your status, you'd stepped away from the market, been retired at least a couple of years. And uh, thought this has to be the first call. Who do I call to mentor retail traders who have a genuine need to learn how to do this properly and make money in their brokerage accounts? And we had that five, 10 minute conversation. A very and short I, and conversation. Then literally I threw 10 mentoring programs at you. And that's how it started for me yeah. and it's been going ever since. So it's amazing, we grow organically from that now to eight mentors. Yeah. And you've literally been the longest serving mentor at the Institute. Yeah, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And you've actually done the most mentoring programs, right? Yeah, I think it's somewhere about 80, 75, 80. 75, 80 mentoring programs now, yeah. over three and a half years. Over three and a half years, it's yeah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, and I, I have been very impressed with the quality yeah. of the, uh, the mentees. Uh, there's a willingness to learn, there's a willingness to embrace risk. Mm. And I think it's a perfect match for people who want to learn how to trade and the, what we can give them from the Institute. So from your experience, when you've been mentoring these 75, 80 guys over the last three and a half years, yeah. from your experience, those guys, uh, what do you see from these guys? Are there any common threads that you can pick up on on mistakes that retail traders make? Maybe even what advice would you give retail traders when they're starting what they need to really concentrate on? Yeah, that's... Um there are a few simple, basic, um, I wouldn't say truths, but there are certain basic skills that you need to embrace. Mm. Some people have them, some people don't, but mm -hmm. they're very easily learned, is that first of all, um, you've got to be patient. Mm. I think the, the view from outside of the trading world is that traders are very uh, short term, very fast paced, completely wrong. Mm. Traders need to be patient, you need to be patient to, you've got to 
be patient to let your opportunities present themselves. And once you've, once they have presented themselves, you've got to be patient to let the timing to put the trades on. And then once you've taken risk, you've got to be patient to let the, let the trades develop. Mm. Just because you've bought something or sold something doesn't mean it's immediately going to work. Mm. This is not a short-term uh, way to make money. So you've got to be patient um, and you've got to be humble because at the Institute, we, as you know, we will give people a methodology how to gel generate ideas, try and get ahead of the where the economies are going. And you've got to develop your own ideas. Don't rely on anybody else. Your ideas, your thought process, your method methodology, we'll educate you along the process, but everybody fine tunes and everybody's got a slight different bias of where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are. Mm. But the most important thing is that you have to be able to generate your own ideas. Mm. Don't rely on anybody else. Don't okay. look, listen to broker, broker research. Your own ideas have your own methodology. And then once you've developed those ideas, you need to be patient to wait for the opportunities to present themselves. Okay. And you have to be patient because we're looking here for anywhere between a one to six month horizon. Mm. So we want to be one or two steps ahead of the Oh yeah, totally. market. We don't want to be three or four steps ahead of the market. That is, as you referred to before, that's investing. And actually, what that is? is one of the best pieces of advice I've ever been given. Yeah. As a youngster by you, always be one or two steps ahead. Yeah. And not three or four. Yeah. Because if you're three or four steps ahead, you end up sitting and waiting forever for trades to actually pan out. And Absolutely. they never, and they generally never do. No, nope. no, nope. because you'd be stopped out. And I guess that's actually the. Going back to that point about being patient, because yeah. I think that needs to be really qualified in trading because the invest the spectrum, and it's called in the industry the investment spectrum. Yeah, that one to three month or even one to six month time frame, where you're running a long short portfolio, yeah. that can be defined as trading. And the shorter time frame you go below that three months, essentially, is defined as trading. Yeah, anything beyond that slowly becomes investing. Absolutely. And that's the three or four steps ahead and not the one or two steps ahead, right? Absolutely. And the, our expertise and our experience that we've had mm. trading is ideally suited to that one to three or even three to six month mm. horizon. Anything more than that, you run the risk of um, too many variables mm. entering into the performance of whatever your positions are. And you can be stopped out because, as you know, one of the things that we do stress at the Institute and you mentioned about the mentees, all the mentees who have been through the program we have been stopped out of positions. Right. Now this is absolutely key to the discipline of being successful at trading. Mm. Every trader needs to be able to get stopped out of a bad position mm. or an unprofitable position. Mm. That is absolutely key and it's a process that every mentee has gone through and once they come out the other side then it's the, on the the, the track to be a successful, accomplished trader. But that will take time. That will take up to anywhere up to two years. Right. The mentees, as I've said to them in the mentor, mentorships, is that you should be looking to be, at the end of two years, an accomplished professional trader. Right. It's not going to happen overnight. As in an all-round trader. An all-round trader. And yeah. you need to be patient with your own progress yeah. as you get to that stage. And there will be, there'll be pluses and there'll be minuses but it's a, it's a long-term process and you need to be patient with your own development. So that's an interesting point on patience. Okay, yeah. so before, you're talking about patience with your process, patience with your positions. Yeah. But obviously, along the investment spectrum, we're trading the time horizon of one to three months and that's trading, yeah. not investing. No. So patience, can, in, in when it comes to your own portfolio positions, goes up to a certain time horizon. But then also with patience, like you just said, patience with your own progress and your own development. Absolutely. So I find a lot of retail traders, and you've probably seen quite a bit of this before yeah. with the mentees, Yeah. they all want to get out the blocks really quickly. Absolutely. And, and they, some do. And of but course, they, they want risk on straight away. They back themselves as we try to push guys. Yeah. But it's not going to happen in four weeks. No. So you, you think it, it should be, they should be targeting a bigger picture as in two years. Absolutely. And work backwards from that. Yeah. Yeah. My experience of the mentees is that, yeah, they're very keen to take risk, almost got to rein them in a little bit mm. and wait for the opportunity to present themselves, wait for the timing to be right to put the trades on and then let be patient to let the trades develop. But as they go through that process, they are learning and mm. developing. And ultimately, as you know, what we're trying to do 
is we're trying to take people to teach people how to think for themselves, mm. take responsibility for their own financial well-being, yeah. and this has implications for the rest of your life. Mm. If you're willing to back yourself, that's mm. another thing that the trader must do. Right. There's no point doing all this work to generate ideas unless you're willing to take risk and back your ideas. Mm. Then it's pointless, and we're teaching people to do that in every every aspect of their life. Mm. So this is actually somewhere where retail traders sometimes fall short. A lot of guys want to go out the gate straight away. Absolutely. And think they can be really good in like four, six, eight weeks. And it's just not going to happen. Like no. You can't become an accomplished trader in that time period. No, it takes time. But then on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes it's the same people. It can be the same people. They want to get out the gates, then they backtrack, they lose confidence. They, you, get, you get other guys or it can be the same person with a split personality. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. They want to trade paper money and they want to have demo mm. accounts. And we have this saying in the Institute, demo accounts don't count. No. You've got to be in the game because you cannot actually quantify a trader's progress over a period of time without actually having real money and risk and backing themselves because you can't measure emotional detachment to P&L. And in terms of emotions, I would say probably out of all mentors that I've had in the last 20 years, you've probably been the number one guy that's taught me to be emotionless when it comes to P&L. Well, how do you control your emotions? Emotional control is absolutely essential mm. to being successful at trading. The, the most important thing about is, as you said, it's the detachment. A few things that I have learned about trading is that, first of all, don't try and give yourself, well, never give yourself any financial targets. Don't try and achieve a certain amount of return. Mm. The returns, because then it will make you trade badly, because mm. you'll try and force things that aren't there. Mm. So first of all, you've got to be realistic about the risk that you're taking. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be realistic about where your soft targets are, where you're looking to take the profits. Um, so that's one thing that you've got to be. You've got to be. Your trading is also a function of what the opportunities which are available in the marketplace. Mm. To take the emotion out of it <clears throat> is that is the most important part of trading is when you get stopped out. Mm. Every single before you put a trade on, you need to know what your stop loss is, mm. and if your stop loss is triggered, you execute the position. You exit the position mm. and get out. And this happens to every single trader. Every trader has traded and they've been successful will have been stopped out of positions. Mm. Stop losses and the discipline are absolutely key. And this is where the emotional detachment is absolutely key mm. because you need to have the emotional detachment from your P&L. Okay, you're, re you're realizing a loss, but you need to be able to switch that off and exit the position. Mm. A good example of that is when we were on the desk at Goldman, okay. I think somewhere around about sort of 2000, 2001, right. just as the Nasdaq bubble started to burst, okay. um, <laughs> we had the, um, the the peak. Subsequently, so it looked as though that we'd hit a peak of, uh, a few months later, and obviously in a bear market, there's going to be some vicious squeezes along the way. Mm. Nothing ever goes up or down a straight line. So, so that's a massive short on it. So we had, there was a, I remember one day yeah. we were very, very short in the back book. Yeah. Um, market was squeezing and really sort of gapping to the upside. We were getting taken short, everything in the front book. And, I remember um, this, it was painful. Yeah, I think we were, yeah. we were down a lot of money. Um, I think at one stage we were short probably about half a billion dollars. Jesus, yes. About I five remember. million dollars and we... Yeah. Um, so I think it was 400 million dollars yeah, yeah. at lunchtime. Yeah, at lunchtime, yeah. Oh my God, yeah. Lunch wasn't, wasn't too good that day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we um, thought, okay, what do we do? Mm. This is the emotional detachment. We could panic and cover the whole lot. Mm. We were, we were, we came in short. Our, our proprietary view was to be short that the markets were going down, our stocks were going down. We were trading telecoms and technology. It's yeah. clearly higher beta yeah. in that environment. So, uh, market goes down two percent. Some of these stocks are going down anywhere between between five and ten percent, uh, and vice versa. And the short squeeze they were seeing, mark was up one two percent. Vicious moves. Our shorts are up anywhere between two yeah. and five percent. <clears throat> That's the nature of the beast. That's the volatility, mm. which, like I said, is opportunity, mm. but clearly. There's also yeah. um, P&L swings associated with that. Yeah. So we were short, we were bearish, got taken short by a lot of um, guys buying stocks either to short cover or to have a punt and sort of think that the market's turned um, and everything's going back to the highs. Mm. We didn't think so. However, lunchtime we had a conversation. We're very short. I remember this conversation. It was actually a horrible conversation to have. Well, we, we could have panicked. We could have yeah. covered the whole lot because we were losing money. That wasn't our view. Um, we could have panicked and been a rabbit in the headlights, yeah. frozen, yeah. unable to do anything. Equally as bad, because 
we were there as market makers, we were there to provide liquidity to institutions, and we, that was our job. Yeah. We needed to be, to be able to continue to trade. The only way we could do this, as, we, as you remember, is that we bought Euro stocks. Yes. And before we did it, we bought the Euro stocks because we needed to reduce the risk. I literally rem remember having this conversation um, where we're sitting next to each other and we literally looked at each other and said, what the hell do we do here? We have to do something. Yeah. And we don't like what we're doing, but we have to do it. And that's about staying in motion, I guess. Staying objective and Absolutely. staying in motion. Completely. Doing something. We had, to, we had to be unemotional and yeah. detached from our P&L and yeah. our risk. Well, we just looked exclusively at risk. We were too short. Mm. We had to reduce that because we needed to stay in the game. Mm. We bought the Euro stocks and we both knew this was going to be the high of the day. Subsequently, it turned out and it, it literally was. was the high of the day. I think we printed the high of the day in Euro stocks. Somebody has to. Yeah. However, when the market started to turn again in the, in the afternoon, yeah. what we did do was we increased the positions and, um, and yeah. increased the shorts. That, I would say, is a textbook of how to trade. We didn't yeah. increase the shorts on the way up. We waited until we reduced the risk to get it back in motion. Yeah. Obviously, we saw the Euro stocks at a loss because our view was still to be short. But when we had conf got confirmation in our own minds that the trade was now going to work, mm. then we increased it. And the end of the, at the end of the day, we were actually we actually came out of the day up. I think we were up small. That was above, insane. But then the next, over the next two days, we made a, a very yeah, a big yeah. amount of money. So in terms of objectivity, the risk in that scenario, it's almost like a textbook case study of emotional detachment, right? Very much so. Because the objectivity and the risk management practices that we were implementing right at that, those moments, it, it was actually all about doing the right thing at the right time. And that's actually a skill set that you can't learn unless you've, you're in it and doing it for real with real money, right? Absolutely. And actually doing the right thing at the right time means we were printing the Euro stocks at the top and we were literally the top tick when we were short yep. that day. Yep. And then putting further shorts on when we were told that the market was going down and collapsing. And we actually came out of that day surviving and just about making some money when we were down massive. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about it as well is in the context, if you remember, we were on the Goldman Sachs trading floor. Yep. I think it was about 24, 25 traders on the desk. Yep. And surrounding you on the trading floor, there's like 200 to 250 people. Yep. And every single person can see all the positions of the traders yep. and all the P&L of every trader. And in scenarios like that, the trading floor goes quiet for the whole afternoon. And you're in, literally in the goldfish bowl. And when you think about it like that, you can really panic and oh, really nice. start to make really very stupid decisions because your whole career can rest on the next several decisions that afternoon. So the training of emotional detachment, obviously in that environment, is insanely intense, right? Very much so. So we've been very at the sharp end. Yeah. Um, retail traders sitting at home, there's no boss looking over their shoulder. No. There's no one telling them what you're doing is incorrect. Absolutely. So emotional detachment is probably more difficult for a retail trader sitting at home by themselves. Would you I, agree with that? I would agree completely. I think um, being a retail trader sitting at home by themselves could be quite a lonely life. Mm. I think this is one of the, the real subtle positives about the mentorship program is that it's not only the scheduled mentor calls, but it's also the contact. Because I've been in situations, I'm sure all traders have been, where you question your own judgment. Yeah. And it's always good to have a sort of little sounding board. Did, am I completely crazy to think about this? Or mm. have you looked at this or you thought about that? Um, just to sort of have a bit of a reality check. Yeah. Um, but the emotional detachment is absolutely key. And this is where we stress the stop losses. Mm. You need to be disciplined about stop losses. And also, as you alluded to that, we increased our shorts when they were starting to work. Mm. Again, the detachment from, if you start a position and it's moved against you, don't increase it. Mm. Only increase positions when they are working. Which may sound counterintuitive, mm. but that is the emotional detachment that you need. Don't fall in love with the position and trade it correctly. So I guess the basic premise here is, is uh, there's obviously a lot more to trading than just this, but having the emotional detachment to add to winners when they're working. Absolutely, add and to winners. Absolute, and have absolutely no emotion to cut losers. Nope. Adding yeah. to winners cutting and cutting losers 
is exactly the same process. Mm. All you're doing is risk managing, and you're, put, you're putting the risk award in your favour. Mm. That's what we're trying to get. That's what we're trying to get the mentees. That's what we're trying to get the retail traders from the institute. That's what we're trying to get them to do. So it's, at all times, you want to get the risk award in your favour, and that may be increasing risk at the right time, but also reducing risk at the right time. So in terms, in terms of that's, I mean, in terms of risk management, that's all great. But you, if you, you can be an amazing risk manager. Yep. But let's be brutally honest here. Yeah. If your ideas are crap. Yeah. You're going to have to end up being the greatest risk manager of all time because your ideas are just awful, right? So ideas play a massive part as well. Absolutely crucial. Mm. I think the idea generation mm. and the risk management are as equally as important as, as each other. It's absolutely essential to be able to generate your own ideas, and it's also absolutely essential to risk manage those ideas correctly. Mm. You need both. You can't do one without the other. So, how in terms of ideas, how do you? And obviously, I have a rough idea, but in terms of some small, some details, how do you take someone on a journey over a number of weeks, months, and teach them how to start generating their own ideas? Well, the easiest process to, the easiest idea generation that I think is, we're looking at the leading indicators in the US market. Mm. Um, we have the same indicators in Europe, but the US is just, mm. you've got high quality information mm. with a very, very broad equity market and you have got consistent information, which is, we can rely on. You have the same information in Europe, but not the same breadth of the equity market. Mm. So the US is the easiest place to, to uh, generate ideas. Not only to generate ideas, but also you have the wherewithal to implement those ideas. Mm. We're looking at the lead indicators, because the equity market as itself is a lead indicator, but it's typically anywhere from between one and six months ahead of the economy. Mm. So we want to be ahead of the, well, the equity market is ahead of the economy, and we're looking where the trends are. Mm. We talked about one to three month or three to six month trades. Mm. The easiest way to make money is to identify the trend and write it. Mm. And we do that by looking at the lead indicators. Look at the sectors, we drill mm. down within the sectors where, where the growth is, where the slowdown is, and we generate the appropriate sectors to be long and short. And then we do some stock selection within that. Mm. I have my tools which I use, um, which I communicate to the mentees. Mm encourage them to look at their own things as well. And then I have my own technical analysis that I use. Again, it's not exhaustive. And one thing about technical analysis is, as you were, as you were very well aware of, we use technical analysis only to time the entry into our trades. We don't look mm -hmm. to generate trades from uh, technical analysis, mm -hmm. only to generate the entry points. Again, like I said, we're trying to get the risk award as much in your favor mm -hmm. to time the entry into the positions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Once that's done, that's the idea generation part. And this is where, again, go back to patience. You can generate a fantastic set of ideas. However, if the timing doesn't look right, right here, right now, be patient, mm. sit on your hands, and wait for the timing to be right. The timing will come right, you may have to be patient. And it may take longer than you think. Mm. I have put numerous trades on, boredom trades, we call yeah. them, yeah. where nothing's going on, you're trying to force something, sure. you end up losing money, cut the position, and you think, what an idiot. All you've done is just written a check mm -hmm. to the market. Yeah. This is, goes back to the patience. This is what I've learned. This is what, you, what you've learned. And this is not something that we try and instill in the mentees and via the institute. <clears throat> Absolutely key. Mm. Do not do any boredom trades. Mm. It will cost you money and you'll feel like a muppet. But also, I think a good idea in trading is not necessarily one that eventually works. No. A good idea in trading to me is one that is probably going to work quite soon. Yep. And it develops and happens and then you're in and you're out. You know, that's what the market's there for, yeah. to, to take the opportunity. Absolutely. It depends on your time frame. Mm. Really much depends on the time frame and depends on the opportunities which present themselves. Mm. One thing I absolutely guarantee is that there are always opportunities out there. Yeah. You, we may not be able to identify them, but there are always opportunities out there. Over that one to three month window in the US equity market, yeah. the amount of ideas is just insane. It's, oh, it's, it's absolutely, infinite. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The hard part is filtering them. Mm -hmm. So you can filter them so that you can make the right, the right decision or generate the right idea. Because there's so much information out there. The skill is get the methodology right, which mm. works for you, and then use it. And this is again, going back to the mentees, to any successful trader, you need to back your ideas. You need to back yourself. So this is one of the fundamental issues that I find with retail traders. And a lot of it comes down to the limiting factors of retail traders. 
which um, with, on the biggest one is time. Ah, so the guy's running their own business, mm-hmm. uh, a, a small, medium-sized business. If a guy's working for a corporate, you know, nine to five, eight to six, whatever, mm-hmm. how many hours do they have really to generate ideas? And I find one of the biggest uh, issues for retail traders is having enough ideas to feed a portfolio mm-hmm. where they can actually manage risk properly once they have positions on. Yep. Um, so for example, like a, an eight, 10, 12 stock asset portfolio. Obviously you can't have a 10 stock portfolio with nine ideas. No. You can't have a 10 stock portfolio with 12 ideas. No. Because not all your ideas are gonna be workable. No. I mean, you're gonna to have to have 20 plus ideas as a minimum. Absolutely. How do these retail traders get it? So the idea generation process is really important and as important as risk management. Absolutely essential, mm. absolutely essential. But the process that I talked about, it takes time to get to be com- to become comfortable with it. Mm. Once you're comfortable with it, then the time frame, the actual amount of time that you have to spend to generate the fresh ideas mm. becomes less and less. You know what you're looking for. Yep. You know how to get the information. You know how to put it all together. You know how to generate the ideas. So it's time consuming to start off with. This is what we run through on the mentoring program, how to generate those ideas. But once you're comfortable with that process, mm. then it becomes much more time friendly. It becomes repeatable. Absolutely. Basically. And as you said about if you want to have an 8 to 12 stock portfolio, mm. you've got to have at least 20 ideas. And so if we've got 8 to 10 positions and we've got 20 ideas on a watch list, it's essential to keep that watch list up to date. Mm. This is one of the, the key weaknesses I find with the, the mentees is making sure that your watch list is mm. up to date because your watch list is your next generation of potential trades. Yeah. So any of your trades which gets stopped out or anything which looks stale or mm. anything which the, if, well, first of all, if the economics trade, the economic fundamentals change on your idea, mm. get out as quick as you can. But your watch list is your subs bench. Mm. This is where your next trades are coming from. So it's absolutely essential that every month you get the fresh economic releases, you refresh your watch list, and that watch list needs to it's be- It's current, it's original, you it's your own work. Exactly. Yeah. And that needs to be a list of trades that are ready to go, but not today. Mm. And if they're ready to go today, you look at your portfolio, is everything exactly how I want it to be? At all times, your portfolio should reflect your view. Mm, if it doesn't, change your portfolio. You're in the boredom trades, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. And you change your portfolio by having your watch list up to date. That's yeah. absolutely key. So I guess, back to that limiting factor, the timing. Yeah. Like, the idea generation process and the limiting factor of timing for retail traders. I mean, I guess that's exactly why you have, or need, and everyone needs a mentor in trading, at least to begin with. Absolutely. Because a retail trader can't buy it in a book, no. you know, off the shelf for no. like $20 on Amazon or whatever. It, it, you've got to actually live it for real. Absolutely. It's exactly why you need a mentor. Completely why you need a mentor, and yeah. you're absolutely right, you need to live it for real. But it is time consuming to start off with, but once it's comfortable with the process, it's very time efficient. See, the muscle memory becomes repeatable, Absolutely. implement it, learn how to implement it in your real life. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So uh, you've been out the city now, public investments, public equities, public assets for a number of years yep. on the professional side. And one of the things that you're actually doing uh, in your retirement is you're actually investing a lot in private equity. Yep. So uh, uh, investing a lot in private businesses. Yeah, private businesses, SMEs, who we will look for established businesses, cash generative, profitable, who yeah. need basically cash to grow. Okay. And we source the money from a variety of different institutions. Um, typically, we have a combination of debt and equity, mm. which we go into um, basically any sector. We've got um, some very dull sectors, uh, sort of uh, parts of the Nissan supply chain. Um, we have got um, a paneling company, which puts panels in them um, in freezer right. refrigerated lorries <laughs> we've got um, a variety we've just bought a stake in a um, bespoke construction company in Newcastle okay this is um, this is not sexy stuff this is not giving the front page of the yeah. of the Wall Street Journal or the FT however <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's there's a lot of money to be made yeah and it's the real nuts and bolts business and it's um, it's it's very 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 enjoyable it's uh, still trade yeah but um, <clears throat> yeah, it's good. It's a nice sideline. So on paper, 
not sexy, but not in sexy. reality, if it just makes money, who cares, right? There's money, <laughs> money, there's money in nuts and bolts. Yeah, so very like trading. Absolutely. It sounds like you're taking your trading disciplines over to private equity. The, it, the trading discipline is yeah. exactly the same, and this is how the Institute can affect the way you think. We're trying to teach you to think, mm. get the skill set, get the process, and you can apply it to every aspect of your life. I think someone once told me uh, about a decade ago from Goldman Sachs, a successful trader becomes always a successful human. And you can implement all of the skill sets that you learn in trading into Absolutely. your real life. Absolutely, yeah. completely. Well, mate, 100%, 100% agree with that. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure to have you in London. We've Great obviously got a few dinners coming up. Thanks and, very uh, much. Thanks for, the, uh, thanks for the interview. And uh, very happy to continue having you on board at the Institute. Delighted to be on board. Incredible mentor to our guys. And you've been a very helpful mentor to me down the years. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Cheers, mate.